looking at three accounts that in some ways could almost be considered individually, but we see this incredible flow as Mark transitions from teaching about Jesus, showing his miracles, to really declaring what it means to now be a follower of his. In these three accounts that we're going to read, we see Jesus powerfully reveal who he is, culminating in this call to radically follow him as a disciple. And as the crucified and risen Messiah, Jesus does call us. And we'll see in these stories where he calls us to be fully committed to him. And so this morning, I want us to answer the question, what does it mean, according to Jesus, to be a radically committed follower of him? First of all, we're going to see this as we begin reading the story of Jesus as it picks up in verse 27. That to be a radically committed follower of Jesus, number one, we must know who Jesus is. We must begin by knowing who Jesus is. Let's look at verse 27. This is the great confession by Peter on behalf of the disciples about who Jesus is. Verse 27 says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. This is an amazing picture that Mark presents in the gospel. The story right before this was where Jesus healed the blind man. And Ryan so beautifully handled that passage. And as Ryan talked about last week in his message, that this story of the blind man being healed is not just a concrete story about Jesus healing a man, though it is. It is about Jesus' power over blindness. But there's also a spiritual element. Remember, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, even Jesus' disciples had been blind spiritually to who he really was. You remember when Jesus even fed the 4,000, they were concerned more with having bread on the boat rather than what it meant that Jesus was the sovereign provider, the Savior of the world. And so we see Jesus healing this blind man, and it's as if as we transition into verse 27 that Jesus begins to heal the spiritual blindness from the disciples, and they begin to see who Jesus is. And we see Peter speaking on behalf of all of the disciples, making this great declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. And that follows what I think is one of the most important questions in all of Scripture. If you could open up the Bible and say, what is the most important question asked in Scripture? This would certainly be one of them. When Jesus looks at the disciples and he says, I don't care what the crowds say. I don't care what the rumor is. I don't care about what those who are just following to see what next miracle I will perform or if they can get a free meal or just want to be a part of the sideshow of what it meant to be around Jesus. When he looks at the disciples and he says, I don't care about all of that, but who do you say I am? It's one of the most important moments in the Bible because it's one of the most important questions and moments in any person's life. The question when we are confronted with, who do you say Jesus is? Not, who do your parents say he is? Not, what does your church tradition say that Jesus is? Not even what you've been taught in Sunday school to say who Jesus is. Who to you? Who do you say Jesus is? That's the beginning of being a truly sold-out, radical follower of Jesus. And the answer that Peter gives on behalf of the disciples is telling. Because the word Messiah or Christ means anointed one, the one anointed or chosen by God. And the name Jesus means salvation. So who is Jesus? He is God's anointed chosen way of salvation. He is Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. 
the one way to salvation. So I would challenge you first and foremost this, this morning, who is Jesus? Who do you say he is? Do you know him in a personal way? Is he more than just the subject of a song or a theological concept? Is he more than something that you learned about in Sunday school or a tradition in your family? Who is Jesus? Is he your Lord and Savior? Do you know him? Is he more than just a concept? Is he your Savior? So what does it mean to be a radically committed follower of Jesus? Number one, we need to know who Jesus is. But then secondly, we see this. Not only do we need to know who Jesus is, but secondly, we need to know what Jesus did. We need to know what Jesus did. So follow the progression here. The spiritual eyes are being opened. Peter makes a declaration that Jesus is Messiah, the anointed one. And then Jesus next lays out his plans about his death. It begins in verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. We need to realize that what Jesus did came with a cost. Now, we often talk about the cost of following Jesus in our terms, as in to follow Jesus comes with a price. It comes with a cost. We must sacrifice something. And that's true, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But before we can truly be a radically sold-out follower of Jesus, we must never forget that the ultimate cost was, the ultimate price paid was Jesus' death on the cross. That the core message of Christianity, the core hope that we hold on to, is that Jesus died for our sins and was raised from the dead. That is not a teaching of Christianity. That is the teaching of Christianity. If you have no cross and the death of Jesus and no physical bodily resurrection, you do not have Christianity. We do not have hope. And we among all people are to be most pitied. Don't miss Jesus' scathing rebuke of Peter. Jesus began to talk about his death, and it says here that he talked about it plainly. He spoke plainly about this. In other words, Jesus wasn't teaching in parables here. Jesus wasn't spiritualizing or allegorizing his death. It wasn't as if he was giving a parable and the disciples had to wonder, is Jesus talking about his death? Is it a literal death? Is it a spiritual death? No. The Bible says that Jesus said plainly, I am going to be killed. The religious leaders who hate me are going to completely reject me. They are going to kill me, and then I will be raised from the dead. The very heart and core message of the gospel. Now, Peter, with his own agenda, and speaking again for the disciples, with their own agenda, actually rebuked Jesus. Now, they probably rebuked him because Jesus had just said that he was going to be the Messiah. Their understanding of Messiah was probably that he was going to be a political Messiah, that he was going to overthrow Rome. They believed he was from God, but how he was going to be Messiah was part of their own agenda. He was going to overthrow Rome. That's why at the end of verse 30, Jesus warned them not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah because most people had this idea that Jesus was going to overthrow Rome. He was going to be a political Messiah. Jesus comes back with the reality of what it meant to be Messiah, that he was going to die. And all of a sudden, Peter and the disciples move on to their own agenda and rebuke him. They rebuke the core message of Christianity. Don't miss that. They rebuke and dispute the message that Jesus would die and be raised from the dead. What does Jesus call the rebuke of that core message of Christianity? What does he call it? He 
calls it satanic. He says, get behind me, Satan. Now, he's not saying that Peter was satanic. He's not saying that Peter was possessed by a demon. But what Jesus is recognizing is that anything that counters the core message of Christianity, the death of Jesus and the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus is of satanic origin. That anything that denies the physical death of Jesus and the bodily resurrection of Jesus rips the hope that we have for eternal life right out of our hands. If there's no death of Jesus and no physical, bodily, literal resurrection, then there is no hope for salvation. There is no forgiveness of sin. This is a reminder to us that if we're going to be sold out radical followers of Jesus, that our hope must be in the the death and resurrection of Jesus, that our core message must be the death and the resurrection of Jesus. One of the greatest satanic forces in the church in America today is the so-called liberal end of Christianity that has either allegorized or denied the physical death of Jesus, who have allegorized or denied the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus, who have taught and proclaimed the idea that God would kill His Son on the cross is sub-Christian, that it's barbaric, that it's archaic. These people who will say, oh, it doesn't matter if a man, Jesus, physically resurrected. It's just the spiritual truth of resurrection. Those people who claim to be Christians are gutting the very gospel. They are robbing people of the only hope that we have that God came to earth, that He died for us, and that He's coming again, that He was resurrected. If we're going to be a radical follower of Jesus, we must radically hold on to the message of the gospel, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that it is the only way to heaven. We can't live in a way that says, oh, if we're good enough, or if we just are moral enough, that's enough. We can't proclaim to our lost friends and family members, hey, you need to accept Christ because He's going to make your life better. He's going, to, he's going to make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's just not the gospel. Because in a moment we're going to see that to follow Christ means to take up our cross. My challenge to us this morning, who say we're followers of Jesus, is, is this. What part does the cross and the resurrection play in our life, our hope, our message, what we share with other people? So what does it mean to be a radically committed follower of Christ? First of all, it's to know who Jesus is. Number two, it's to know what Jesus did. And then finally, what does it mean to be a radical follower of Jesus? It means to know what Jesus requires to know what Jesus requires. If He is Messiah, if He did die for our sin and was raised from the dead, what does He require of us who follow after Him? Look at verse 34. Then He called the crowd to Him along with His disciples and said, Whoever wants to be My disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow Me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. Don't miss this fact. There's a reason that the Bible points out that Jesus then turned to the crowd and to his disciples and made this call to deny self, to take up the cross and to follow him. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus gathering a crowd and then at different times turning to that crowd and making a hard, difficult statement about what it means to be a disciple. I remember one of, my, one of the most pointed places in the Bible is John chapter 6. 
where the crowds are following Jesus. Some of you know what Jesus declared. As the crowds got bigger, the Bible says that Jesus turned to them and said, if you want to follow after me, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. And do you remember what the Bible says? Many people were dismayed at what he said and quit following him. This is another one of those moments where Jesus is going to make it clear the difference between being around him and being a radical follower of him. He looks at the crowd, he looks at his disciples and said, you want to follow me? Deny yourself, which is one of the most difficult things that we can do. Take up your cross, and everyone knew what the cross was. It was an instrument of death, and follow me. You don't think at that time a few people stepped back and said, whoa, this cross, what are you talking about? Denying myself, hey, I'm around, I'm around you, Jesus, because I'm waiting for the next fish and bread extravaganza. What are you talking about? Jesus is making it clear that to follow him means more than being around him. It means to be a radical disciple. Very quickly, what is it that Jesus requires of us? If we're to be a radical follower of him, he says, number one, we must deny ourselves. Self-denial is one of the most difficult things that we can do as human beings. We, we know this because what do we do every January 1st? We make New Year's resolutions. And what do half of us do on January 2nd? We break them. Sometimes we get maybe to the middle of the month. Some of you might be good and might make it to March. But it's the most difficult thing we do to deny what we want. Jesus says we must deny ourselves. What do we do as a culture? Well, we want the new TV. We want the new car. We want the new dress. We can't afford it, so what do we do? We put it on a credit card, even though we've only paid the minimum balance for seven years. Because we want what we want. <coughs> the human sinful nature that we battle with and we will battle with until the moment we are glorified in heaven is always saying, take what you want and take it now. In the 1960s, Stanford University did a, a really well-known study looking into uh, this concept of self-denial and self-control. It's famously called the marshmallow test. And researchers brought in uh, hundreds of four-year-olds, brought them into a room, and gave the child one marshmallow and said, you can eat this marshmallow now or I need to leave the room. If you can wait until I come back, you can have two marshmallows. It's your choice. And the researcher would leave and the child would either uh, wait to have two marshmallows or the child would immediately put it in his mouth. Now, the Stanford researchers followed this test group of children and you know what they found? After a dozen years, 12 years of studying those same children, they found statistically that those who grabbed the single marshmallow and ate it tended to be more troubled in their adolescence. The kids who wolfed down the one marshmallow instead of waiting for two actually scored an average of 210 points less on the SAT. There's real documented value to controlling and disciplining our desires. So what is it that Jesus is talking about here when he says, deny yourself? I think there are two key things that we are called to deny when we are following Jesus in a radical way. Number one, we are denying our sinful nature. The Bible makes it clear that we are in a battle our entire lives with our sinful nature. We as believers have the new nature of Christ in us. But until the day we die and receive our glorified bodies and minds and wills in heaven, we will continually battle this sinful nature. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul autobiographically shares this struggle with his sinful nature in Romans 7. He says, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate, I do. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. So here's the challenge. 
If we're in that battle and Jesus calls us to deny self, how do we do that? Well, number one, begin understanding that denial, denying self to follow Christ, is a lifelong battle. We're never going to master it. We can't come to a point of perfection on this earth. Number two, understand that this process will involve failure. Our sanctification, becoming more like Christ, is not a straight line up. It's a jagged ridge of two steps forward, three steps back, one step forward, three steps back, three steps forward, two steps back. It's the nature of what it means to battle our sinful nature. But we also need to understand that because Christ is in us, because we're indwelt with the Holy Spirit, we can, with His help, overcome our sin. We can become more like Christ. We can overcome sinful tendencies, sinful, sinful behaviors. And we must understand that we need the Holy Spirit to do that. We can't do it on our own, but Christ in us can overcome and grow us into Christ's likeness. And the only way you do that is to spend time daily in the Word in prayer, being in a church family, having someone to encourage you and hold you accountable. Can I tell you, if you want to overcome sin by denying yourself, don't focus on your sinful behavior. The way to overcome sin is to become more in love with Jesus, to love Jesus, to love obeying Him, to love Him more than the sinful desires of our flesh. If we spend all our time trying not to do this, we are missing the point. What does the Bible say in Galatians chapter 5? It says, the fruit of the Spirit is joy, peace, self-control, gentleness, kindness, and love. So if we want that to be reality instead of sin, then the fruit of the Spirit means that we learn to rely on the Spirit. We learn to love Jesus more. We rely on Him more. We spend more time in the Word. We spend more time memorizing Scripture. We spend more time praying so that He can transform us from the inside out. And then finally, I would say this, not only do we deny our sinful nature, but Jesus, I believe, is calling us to deny our self-made plans. Part of self-denial is allowing Jesus to plan out and direct our lives. That means seeking leadership from the Holy Spirit. It means letting His plans become our plans. You know, most of the time when we make our own plans, they're not bad plans. It's not like many of us sit down. I know maybe occasionally we do. But most of the time when we make our own plans, we have the best intentions at heart, don't we? We generally want to honor God. We want to bring glory to Him. And we make our own plans. And what we need to deny is not so much we need to deny making bad plans. Instead, we make good plans. It's really a denial of making our good plans and instead following God's best plans for our life. When we seek after God's direction for our life instead of making our own plans, that's when we deny self, we put ourselves on the back burner, and we allow God to work through us. And can I tell you, following God's plans, denying our own plans, it's rarely pain-free. It's rarely the easiest way. We won't always, and quite frankly, I'm convinced we rarely will see why sometimes God allows us, directs us to go in this direction. But it's part of what it means to radically follow Jesus. I, I can tell you, Dana and I were talking about this this week. And I don't know about you, we need to understand that following God's plan often comes with that price. Of all the major decisions that Dana and I have made over the years to be obedient, to follow uh, the Lord is wanting us to do have, has almost always been accompanied by friends, family members, even church folks saying things like, you're crazy. You shouldn't do that. That can't be God's will. Why are you doing that? Almost every major decision we've made to follow after God's plans for our life have come with people and family members being upset and pulling away. That's just the reality. That's 
the costs of denying self. What's attractive about denying self? Well, there's not much attractive in the temporal, but look at what the Bible says in verses 35 through 37. This is what we hold on to. This is why we deny self, even when it comes with a cost. Jesus says, For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it? What good is it for you? What good is it for me? If we gain the whole world, yet forfeit our soul. So Jesus says we must deny ourselves. Jesus says we must take up our cross daily. To take up our cross daily means that we recognize that our life is not our own. Basically, Jesus is saying that we must be willing to not only give our lives literally, but we must daily die to self. It's a recognition that our life is not our own. We don't get this in America. We don't get what it means when Jesus says, take up your cross, to take up death. But you know, there are brothers and sisters across the world in places like the Sudan, in different parts of Africa, in the Middle East, who every day, have to make the decision, am I going to forfeit my life? Will I die for Christ? Will I choose to hold on to it? For those of us in America, we may not have that choice, but what this is at the very minimum is a call every day to die to self. Our crosses, they were called to bear, it's not a call to give up certain things. Our cross is not our unfair boss. Our cross is not a difficult child. Our cross is not an illness or a handicap. Our cross is a call to die and to die to self. If we're going to be fully devoted followers of Jesus, it's a recognition that our life is not our own. And then he finally says, if we want to be a disciple, we deny ourselves, we take up the cross, and then we follow him. And to follow him implies action. It's not just a mental assent or a spiritual uh, decision. To follow Him means commitment. It implies investment. It implies obedience. It implies boldness. Look at verse 38 again. This is what it means to follow. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is the reality of what it means to follow Him. If anyone, verse 38, is ashamed of me, And my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. It means we take up the cross, we're bold. It implies action and commitment and investment. So the challenge is this. Who is Jesus? Who do you say He is? The Bible calls us to acknowledge that He is Messiah. It calls us to recognize who He is, but more than that, to recognize what He's done, to cling to the cross and the hope of the resurrection, to not deny it, but to hold on to it as our hope, and then to follow after Him by denying self and taking up the cross, by following Him. And so the challenge is for us to ask this morning, again, who is Jesus? Who is He in your life? If you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I urge you, commit your life to Him. It's not an easy believism. It's not a quick decision. Jesus is calling you to give Him your life. To take up the cross, to deny yourself, and to follow Him. And you may say, well, that's not very attractive. Why would I do that? You know what the alternative is? The alternative is a life without purpose and meaning, and the alternative is an eternity eternally separated from God in hell. The call is to deny yourself while you live on this earth so that you might reign with Him in joy and peace in the presence of God forever. The call to follow Christ is not a call to have a more comfortable life, (coughs) to have an easy life, to have what you want. It's a call to surrender who you are now so that you might gain everything in eternity. It's a call to know Jesus and to love Him and to be loved by Him. 
And this is a call for those of us who do know him to examine our hearts and say, are there any areas that I need to surrender? Are there any areas where I am Lord instead of him? Are there any areas that I need to deny? Are there any areas that I need to crucify in my heart, my attitude, my behavior? I think it's a call for us to say, am I seeking after Jesus and do I love him and want him more than what my sinful nature loves and what my sinful nature wants? This is a call for us to take seriously Jesus' requirement to follow Him with all that we are. Thomas Akempis wrote this. He said, Jesus has many who in heaven, but few who bear His cross. He has many who desire comfort, but few who desire suffering. He finds many to share His feast, but few His fasting. All desire to rejoice with Him, but few are willing to suffer for His sake. Many follow Jesus to the breaking of bread, but few to the drinking of the cup of His passion. Many admire His miracles, but few follow Him in the humiliation of the cross. This morning as we sing our closing song, I would invite you, if there are any areas of your life that you need to surrender to the Lord, would you do that as we sing? As we sing the front area will be open. Maybe you feel led this morning just to come down and pray. Maybe you need to pray for someone. Maybe you need to pray for yourself. Myself, other pastors will be up front. If you want to pray with one of us, we'll be here. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, I invite you to step out and this morning pray and receive Him. Ask Him to be your Lord and Savior. Commit your life to Him. Whatever the Lord is doing, would you commit yourself to Him fully this morning? Father, as we sing, we pray that we would truly follow You whatever that means, and in all things what it means, that we would faithfully obey. Lord, uh, I ask that you'd be with us. Help us to make commitments and decisions that you've laid on our heart this morning. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing.